Hans Strauss, I'm UNC's Executive Vice Provost and Chief International Officer. It's my honor today to welcome His Excellency Valle de Almeida, Ambassador of the European Union to the United States. Welcome to UNC in Chapel Hill. Uh, the Ambassador is visiting North Carolina as part of the EU's delegation. It's called Beyond the Beltway Initiative. This is to engage with local and state government officials, public and private sector leaders, think tanks, and educational forums. His visit today is supported by the Center for European Studies and the Ambassadors Forum. UNC's Center for European Studies is one of only 10 European Union centers of excellence across the country. And we are honored that our center has been chosen to serve as the network coordinator of the EU centers. The center is also a proud co-organizer of the Ambassadors Forum, together with Klaus Lares, the Richard Krasno Distinguished Professor of History, who's sitting up here in the front row, and with UNC Global. This forum brings prominent diplomats to campus to share their experiences with our students. One of our priorities at UNC is to provide our students with a global education, and the Center for European Studies plays a critical role in advancing this priority. On behalf of the university, I would like to thank the Center for its many academic outreach and programmatic endeavors, including the Ambassadors Forum, that helped to make UNC a more globally engaged campus. We are privileged to hear from the Ambassador today about European foreign policy in the making. The Ambassador has substantial experience and knowledge to share on this topic. In light of current negotiations on an EU-US free trade agreement, as well as increased tensions in the Middle East, the Ambassador's presentation comes at a very topical and important time. I look forward to hearing his perspectives on these events, as well as on US and European policy and actions on other issues. Ambassador Valle de Almeida has enjoyed a long and distinguished career with the European Union, culminating in his 2010 appointment as the EU ambassador to the United States. He joined the European Commission in 1982 at its delegation in Lisbon after spending years as a journalist. Prior to his appointment as ambassador, he held many positions within the EU. Most recently, he served as the Director General for External Relations at the European Commission, the EU's executive body. As the most senior official under High Representative Vice President Baroness Ashton, he helped formulate and execute the EU's foreign policy and played a key role in preparing for the European External Action Service introduced by the Treaty of Lisbon. From 2004 to 2009, he served as head of cabinet for the European Commission presidents, Jose Manuel Barroso, and was the representative for negotiations on the Treaty of Lisbon and acted as the EU's Sherpa for G8 and the G20 summits. He holds a degree in history from the University of Lisbon and has studied and received training in journalism and management in the US, France, Japan, and the UK. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Valle de Almeida. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Strauss, for these very kind words. Thank you all for being here. Well, I see that uh, Chapel Hill is busier than Washington, D.C. <laughs> and uh, you are not shut down on the country. You seem to be very much uh, alive and kicking uh, over here. We can discuss the situation in Washington, although as, a, as an ambassador, I'm not allowed to comment too much on internal domestic uh, policies and uh, political context in the US. But it's great to be here. It's my very first time here, so I'd like to thank the University of North Carolina, uh, all the professors here, all the students. I see also a colleague from Brussels who's staying here. Hello, Paula. Uh, uh, it's, it's great to be here, but I'd like to start by paying tribute to, uh, to Dr. Eric, Erica Edwards, who's here uh, with us. He's been a pioneer in uh, European studies. He's running the 
your European center. She's running the EU Center of Excellence here in, in Chapel Hill. So I want to uh, thank her for all the support. I want to thank all those that participate uh, and are part of this endeavor. We are very happy to support it. So, um, and we hope we can continue to work in promoting European studies and interest about Europe. And I see so many young people here. It's always a privilege. It's the best part of my job. But you don't tell anybody else in Washington, please. The best part of my job is to be able to, to, to get out of Washington. <laughs> uh, but most of all, most of all uh, to be able to talk to people like you, the future generations that will be running this country and this world, and to share a few thoughts about what we do in Europe, what we do together across the Atlantic and what we can do in the future. Uh, uh, you asked me to basically uh, talk about foreign policy. Uh, it's difficult to separate foreign policy from any other policy. Uh, uh, it's difficult to separate foreign policy from what else we do in Europe. So I'll try to give you a little bit of, a, of an overall picture of where we are today, going back and forward in time. And then I'll be more than glad, and I think that will be the most interesting part of our journey, is to uh, reply to your questions and try to address some of your uh, concerns. So again, thank you very much for coming, all the professors, all the students, and uh, we look forward to uh, this uh, discussion. Uh, I, was, I started my visit here uh, this morning by meeting the Secretary of Commerce, uh, and we had a very good discussion about uh, trade and investment. We may come back to that in the questions and answers session. But I was able to highlight to her uh, uh, the, the importance of the links between North Carolina and Europe. I quoted a few, a few figures which I'll pass on to you. Um, European investment in North Carolina supports more than 88,000 jobs across the state. That's important. Uh, you exported to the US roughly 5 billion dollars of goods and the same amount in services. Uh, and this is again important. And if we conclude our free trade area negotiations, we expect these figures to grow by, you know, 30 percent is a good estimate. Uh, we, we will hope that this will create uh, another couple of uh, uh, dozen thousands of jobs uh, uh, over here. So uh, I think we have a dynamic relationship, if I take North Carolina separate from the rest of the US, uh, between North Carolina and in Europe, and uh, we were discussing ways and means to make this even better. I just wanted to give you a North Carolina context as well before we move to the wider picture. So we are very confident that we can continue this good cooperation with your state and uh, you know, move it even further and uh, uh, with a more ambitious approach. So where, where do we come from if we talk about um, uh, today's Europe and European foreign, uh, foreign policy? Um, I think you have to, you have to consider the, the previous century. Uh, you have to consider what uh, happened, uh, the two world wars that started in Europe. Uh, you have to think that Europe has been at war basically for the last 2,000, 3,000 years. Europeans have been killing Europeans. It's not the best thing to do in life, uh, but that's history. And, uh, and uh, you know, after the, the Second World War, so halfway through the, the last century, we, uh, we realized that, you know, we could do better. And we needed to do better. We needed to find ways to stop this logic of war inside Europe. And since then, we've been living actually the longest period of peace in that part of the world. As simple as that. The last 60, 70 years have been the longest period of peace for a number of countries in the, in the European Union. And you do not understand Europe, and you do not understand the European Union, if you, do con you, if you don't consider this starting point. Peace was the main uh, sort of reason why uh, some bright people, visionary people at that time, decided to launch this. We had the American support, you know, the Marshall Plan, you know, everything that America did to support reconstruction in Europe. America wanted a united Europe also to prevent going back to some of the, uh, you know, the ghosts of the past. 
uh, in Europe. And this is how it, all, uh, the, how it all started. And if you look back again, you will consider, as I do, I hope you do, that this has been what I esteem as being the most effective uh, peacekeeping, peacemaking, conflict prevention operation in the history of mankind. Because we were able to start with six countries, we are now 28. Half a billion people, more than half a billion people right now, uh, living in peace, democracy, respect for human rights, respect for the rule of law, individual freedom, the highest levels of quality of life, consumer protection, environmental protection, protection of, in, of enterprises and investment, but at the same time enhancing uh, uh, standards and regulations that we believe are the best in the, in the public interest. Uh, this is what Europe is today. In doing so, we brought in countries that were under dictatorship. My own country. I lived 17 years in a dictatorship uh, before democracy came and after that accession to the European Union. You think of Spain, you think of Greece. But if you look at the other side of Europe, all these countries that were behind the Iron Curtain for a number of years within the Soviet Empire. So we brought all of these countries, with the exception of the stubborn Swiss uh, and Norwegian, uh, that we will convince one day, don't worry. Um, you, you look at the map of Europe, you see this continental uh, dimension of countries united by these values. So you don't understand Europe, you don't understand anything about the European Union if you don't consider seriously the basic reason why uh, we have done this. But our job is not yet finished. Uh, if you look at Europe, apart from Switzerland and Norway, who are very uh, happy and prosperous countries, uh, you have a number of countries that still need, uh, still need us to help them come out of their problems. And if you look at the Balkans, for instance, uh, where we've seen very difficult situations only a few years ago and very horrendous wars, uh, we still have to finish the job there. Uh, we have incorporated Slovenia and Croatia, two of the Balkan countries. There are a number of them waiting to, to come in. Serbia, Montenegro, Albania, the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, and a few others. Kosovo is uh, preparing hard as well. Uh, so there are a number of countries there that still aspire, Bosnia as a government, of course, that still aspire to, to join the European Union. And the perspective of joining the Union is the most important drive for reform and reconciliation there. So we have a responsibility towards them. They aspire to join us, so the work is not over yet. And all this enterprise that I briefly described uh, has been uh, rewarded very recently, as you well know, and we were extremely proud, by the Nobel Peace Prize in 2012. This was, in my view, a recognition of past achievements and encouragement for future achievements in the way towards a never closer union uh, in this uh, part of the world. So we were extremely happy, extremely proud, and I wanted to share this with you because I believe the Nobel Peace Prize sort of encapsulates uh, the meaning of the European Union uh, since we created it, which is exactly my age, because I was born uh, in 1957, which is the year we signed, uh, we entered into force the Treaty of Rome, which is a founding treaty of, of the European Union. So a lot has happened. Uh, and we are very proud that uh, the Nobel Peace Prize sort of recognized all that. Um, foreign policy. So how does foreign policy fit into, into all this? What's the logic of it? Let me uh, try to put it in, a, in perspective. Uh, so our purpose initially was to bring these countries together. Our purpose was to uh, eliminate the reasons for people to solve their problems by going to war. Uh, so instead of going to war, you know, debate and discuss about, about a text, about a treaty, about rules. Uh, bring together your interests so that, you know, 
uh, your coal is also my coal, your steel is also my steel. And this was the logic in the, in the 50s and 60s because the war effort was based on coal and steel. If you didn't have coal and steel, you couldn't wage war. Uh, but if, if you manage to you know, have a common market for these uh, major elements of a war effort, you kind of reduce the tensions among the countries. So the purpose was starting with the economy to building links, interdependence, interconnection that would make war simply not a good way out, simply not a solution uh, to solve our problems. But once you start bringing the economy together and sectors of the economy together, you realize that for things to work uh, effectively and efficiently, you would need to ensure free circulation of people, free circulation of goods, free circulation of capitals, free circulation of services, so that the companies can do better business, they can create more jobs, they can benefit from the size of the market, the scale of the market. And progressively, we, were, uh, uh, we sophisticated our mechanisms. We started with a customs union, which is having the same kind of tariffs towards the outside world. We moved towards a single market, where all these four freedoms were recognized and, uh, and, and uh, implemented uh, throughout all the, uh, the countries. One point we realized that it would make sense to have a single currency, because you know companies operate in the same market, why should they have the, the burden of different currencies? Uh, and having a single currency will reinforce our, capaci our external capacity in dealing with other partners. And uh, at one point people said, because all of this economic dimension is so important, we need to look at the political dimension. We need to look at ways and means to reinforce the political structures, because we have democracies that need to be uh, attentive to decisions taken in Brussels. We need to, to be accountable to our voters. And uh, if all this makes sense, at one point, we need to have a common voice on foreign policy. At one point in this process, it makes sense for us to, instead of having 28 foreign policies, to have at least a, a hard core of common positions uh, on, on the way we deal with the outside world. So you've seen in the last 30 years, 40 years, a gradual evolution towards a common foreign and defense and security policy in the European Union. But like everything in the European Union, and I would like to stress this very much, our progress and our evolution is a gradual one. Uh, we started with a few treaties. I mentioned the Treaty of Rome, I could mention the Treaty of Paris and a few others. But we have revised those treaties, which are a sort of constitution of the European Union. The latest one being the Treaty of Lisbon. So that our progress is always gradual, incremental. We don't start with a blueprint and we know that we have to do in the next 20 or 40 years time. No, we, we make progress on the basis of the, the steps we take and the agreements and the consensus we are able to, to find. And that's how we have progressed enormously uh, towards a more structured foreign policy. And the latest developments, let me spend a few minutes there, are enshrined in the Treaty of Lisbon, which is my hometown, by the way, and I was happy to be a negotiator of the Treaty of Lisbon on behalf of the European Commission. If you go, I don't suggest you read it entirely because it's very boring, but, uh, uh, and the language is not uh, attractive, but the contents of it are very important for foreign policy uh, uh, considerations. Uh, you have basically there the creation of a new, an, a new person, a new job, a new function, a new role in the Union, which is called the High Representative for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy. Uh, that's my most direct boss. I was with her in Washington on Monday, uh, uh, Baroness Catherine Ashton. Uh, she is, uh, for a couple of years uh, now, uh, the HR uh, the High Representative for Foreign Policy and Security of the European Union. It's a new job, uh, and for her to be able to, uh, to you know, perform her duties, uh, the treaty also created a, 
an entity called the European External Action Service, EEAS, which is the bureaucracy I'm part of. This is a sort of, a sort of uh, European foreign minister, but it is not a European foreign minister proper. It's a, a structure that supports the high representative, who is a sort of foreign minister of Europe. Uh, we have to be careful with these uh, concepts. But basically, it's a, a diplomacy structure that helps uh, the high representative. We have 140 embassies around the world. I'm the ambassador to the United States. I have about 80 to 90 people working with me in, in Washington, D.C. Stacy Hope over there is one of them. Uh, and please be in touch with us through website, Twitter, Facebook, whatever. Uh, so we have 140 structures of this kind, which are sort of embassies of the European Union uh, throughout the world. And we have a few thousand colleagues in Brussels helping Cathy Ashton, shaping this policy, working on this. We work, of course, with the member states. We coordinate the member states. In Washington, I host and chair a regular meeting, in fact it happens tomorrow morning, uh, over breakfast of uh, the 28 ambassadors plus myself. I offer them a frugal breakfast because times are difficult, but most of all we, we, we discuss and we agree positions and tomorrow we'll be talking about, I cannot reveal everything, but uh, tomorrow we'll be talking about what happened in New York last week, on Iran, on Syria, on climate change, on a few other things. It was a very interesting and important week. We'll be talking about more in detail about what we're going to do next on Iran, what we're going to do next on Syria. We'll talk about TTIP, the future free trade area across the Atlantic, and we will exchange positions, information, and, uh, and sort of define the way forward for the next couple of weeks. And we work very well together. And this happens throughout the world, uh, where national ambassadors, so I have the ambassadors of all the 28 countries which are represented in Washington, uh, together with me. This happens, the same kind of cooperation happens uh, throughout the world. In Brussels, you have the ministers meeting under the chairmanship of my boss, also to coordinate positions. You have the ambassadors meeting there as well. So there's a whole set of structures where Europeans representing the member states and Europeans in charge of sort of coordinating all this come together, bring together all their expertise to make uh, uh, European influence even more important uh, around the world. We also cover areas like development policy, defense as well, with different degrees of ambition and capacity and capability, but it's basically a, a way to maximize the impact of Europeans uh, around the world. Uh, a few areas where we are concentrating our efforts to a very large extent, first of all, our neighborhood. To the east, we have Russia, we have Central Asia, we have Turkey, uh, we have the Middle East. To the south, we have Northern Africa, uh, Egypt, Libya, all the way to, to Morocco. This is our area of uh, neighborhood, as we call it. This is our sort of backyard. Uh, we believe we have a special responsibility towards our neighbors. We also know that situation on their side has an impact on us. So it's also out of self-interest, but it's also, also out of solidarity. Uh, so this is one top priority for Cathy Ashton and for all of us. Uh, the other one is to be able to use all the instruments that we have. You know, trade policy is a foreign policy instrument. Development policy is a foreign policy instrument. A defense instrument. Uh, regulatory issues can be a foreign policy instrument. So we approach foreign policy in a in a, in, a, in a sort of wide way. Uh, we don't consider a narrow concept, we consider a wider the concept of uh, narrow policy and we try to, uh, a foreign policy, and we try to bring together all the instruments we have at the European Union to make us more, uh, more effective. Uh, a third area which is important to consider is what we do, what we do around the world and uh, our capacity to influence the way events uh, evolve in the world, and that again, you, you, you can use all sorts of mechanisms. Uh, we don't limit ourselves to the neighborhood, we are very keen to, to work with uh, all our partners, 
And lastly but not least, we would like to, and we are, uh, paying particular attention to the work we do with our strategic partners. Countries like the United States, or Canada, or Mexico, or South Africa, or Korea. There are a few of, our, of these countries who are considered for us the, the strategic partners, the most important partners with whom we share a, a lot in common and with whom we want to do things together. And of course the most important of them uh, is the United States. Uh, it's by far our most important ally, best friend, best customer, best investor. Uh, this is a unique relationship and uh, I'm very proud and privileged to, to be at the center of this relationship in Washington. And uh, we've done a lot together, as you know, and we still have a lot to do, uh, a lot to do, uh, uh, a lot to do together. And uh, I would like to uh, conclude by mentioning what we do together in a number of areas, which you, I'm sure, have been following in the last few weeks um, or so. So a few comments on current topics, and I'm sure your questions will prolong the discussion on this. Uh, if I consider, if I consider Iran. Uh, which is maybe the top issue now for my boss, Cathy Ashton. She was in Washington, we were, we were at the White House uh, uh, discussing this after a long week in, um, in, uh, in, in the United Nations. Uh, things have changed quite dramatic, dramatically in the last couple of weeks, as far as Iran is concerned. We sense a new attitude in Tehran, we have new interlocutors, in the persons of the new president and the new foreign minister, who's also the new negotiator for the nuclear issues. We, we are hopeful, but we are not naive. We are hopeful that there is a new process starting, that there is a new opportunity to find solutions, but we are not naive to the point of believing that everything is done. We haven't seen nothing yet, by the way. We have had talk, but no action. We have had openings, but no uh, formal, concrete proposals put on the table yet. So Cathy Ashton is hopeful, she remains committed, but she remains very clear about not accepting any delaying tactics from the Iranian side. Uh, the good thing is that we have agreed to call for a, a new uh, round of negotiations that will take place uh, 15th and 16th of October in, in Geneva. Cathy Ashton chairs on behalf of, of the other side, so she's the direct interlocutor of the f Iranian foreign minister, on behalf of the five permanent members of the Security Council and Germany. And she's, uh, again, I cannot go too much into the details, but you know, there's a good, there has been a, a, a set of developments which point to the right direction on Iran. And in, on this file, as in many others, we have been working together with the US on sanctions and on negotiations, on the sticks and on the carrots. We've been uh, together and this is uh, proved fundamental in, in my view, changing the attitude on the Iranian side. If you take Syria, uh, an extremely difficult foreign policy issue these days, uh, first of all, a, a you know, a, a a humanitarian situation which is the worst we've seen in many years. Uh, but also, you know, a very ferocious war, 100,000 victims, apart from the use of chemical weapons, which of course uh, had an important role in changing the, the situation uh, recently. Again, there are the EU, EU and the US together, you know, wanting to condemn and condemning effectively the chemical weapons use and this was culminated by, with a, a resolution by the Security Council, forcing the parties to come to a solution, we want a political solution, we want them to meet in Geneva uh, to discuss this, very much supportive of the humanitarian effort uh, in Syria. A lot remains to be done, uh, we can discuss that if you want later on, but my point here being on a major foreign policy issue, you not only have Europeans largely on the same wavelength, you have Europeans and Americans largely uh, on the same wavelength. And this is 
of course, crucial. Let me take Egypt. Cathy Ashton is in Egypt today as we speak. She flew to London and London to Cairo on between Monday and Tuesday. Uh, it is her 14th trip this year to Cairo. She's been 14 times or 13 times before this one in Cairo uh, because she uh, feels that Egypt is uh, a crucial case in the Middle East. It's by far the most important country in the Arab world. It's a very important country in that part of the Mediterranean. Uh, whatever happens in Egypt will have an impact in the whole region, as much as an impact on the Middle East peace process as well. Very crucial for our ally uh, Israel. Uh, so she's focusing a lot on that. Uh, you may have heard in a few weeks ago that she, she was the only leader to be able to, to meet former President Morsi in the place where he is uh, uh, taken by, has been taken by the new authorities. She, she is meeting numerous people today and tomorrow in Cairo. And, uh, and again, we've been working together with the US. You know, my colleague uh, was in charge of that area, was with the Deputy Secretary of State many times in recent weeks together in Cairo trying to move things forward. Um, and uh, this is another example, and I've chosen these three, Iran, Syria, and Egypt, as an, uh, illustrations of how much we, on Europe, are on the same wavelength. There is today in Europe, uh, it's difficult to find an issue in which you, you, you identify fundamental differences between or among member states of the European Union on foreign policy. I'm sure you can find a few and I'll, I'll reply to that, but there are a few if you consider the whole set of issues that one needs to deal with in foreign policy. That is the same between Europe and America. It's difficult to find things that really divide us on the way we approach uh, this kind of issue. That was not always the case. Remember the Iraq war. Remember other situations where we uh, disagreed on Latin America, for instance, a few decades ago, and many other issues. Today, we are much closer together, much more on the same page than we were before. And let me finish with this. I think there's still a lot we can do together, a lot more we can do together, a lot better than we can do together. Uh, you and us, Americans and, and Europeans. Certainly on managing the hot spots of the world. I mentioned three. There are many more, unfortunately. Certainly in dealing with uh, uh, new threats. And if you talk to the defense and security community, uh, they are very much concerned with cyber, cyber war, cyber crime, cyber terrorism. Uh, as much as we all are concerned by nuclear proliferation. Two threats that cannot be successfully dealt with uh, if we don't work together. And we are working together. I mentioned Iran, but I could mention North Korea. Uh, on cyber, we need to find ways to identify the threat and deal with the threat. Uh, and this is a very serious area of concern. But certainly we also need to look at the global challenges. So again, the concept of foreign policy is more than 19th century foreign policy or diplomacy. Uh, climate change is an issue of foreign policy today. Uh, clearly, water is becoming an issue of uh, foreign policy. Energy security is more and more uh, so an issue that one needs to deal having in mind foreign policy and security uh, implications. And last but not least, we live in a, in a global economy, we live in an interconnected world. We need to think about how to govern this world. And, I, and sincerely, I think we can do better uh, in governing this world. Uh, the mechanisms that were created in the past century, and sometimes in the middle of the past century, uh, they are not necessarily proven to be effective in dealing with these new realities, which are much more complex. If you look at the economy where everything is integrated and globalized in a very sophisticated way, if you think of the financial markets, the degree of sophistication of the management of these markets, and if you look on the other side to how we, the, the mechanisms we have to govern the world in a political sense, there is a, a, a huge gap. On one side, sophistication, on the other side, largely, improvisation. So this, this gap is an issue that is a cause for concern. So 
on top of the hotspots, on top of the global threats, new global threat, on top of the global challenges linked to our planet, there's this issue of global governance, which is something, I believe, where uh, uh, the EU and the US need to work uh, more together. So, in a nutshell, uh, we have a foreign policy, we are progressing towards an even more sophisticated foreign policy framework in the European Union. This is part of an evolution that I tried briefly to describe of a never closer union in, the, in, the, in that part of the world. But we believe that we can do more and we can do better in our cooperation with the US. And we are committed, as our presidents are, to moving this relationship forward. So I thank you for your attention and I'm ready to engage in the dialogue with you now. Thank you very much. So you, that was loud. Uh, so you spoke to the incremental growth of European Union and speaking in terms of policy. What do you think will be the greatest challenge to, as the EU ex, you know, expands membership, to change 28 European or 28 foreign policies into sort of one coherent foreign policy? Well, I think that the, uh, the major challenge overall, if you think of... Uh, the progress of the European Union and the progress of foreign policy, in my view, will be defense. Uh, and the way we approach our defense capabilities, our defense expenditure, and, uh, and the way we maximize our effort. What we have today, to a large extent, uh, is uh, 28 national defense policies, 28 national defense efforts, 28 national defense budgets. We have elements of a common defense policy in many areas. I didn't mention to you, but I could, all the, the missions we have around the world where European military get together for a, a, a particular purpose. We have thousands of Europeans placed around the world in different missions accomplishing different objectives. But it's still, one must recognize, a very preliminary stage of integration in terms of defense policy. And in today's world, if you, think, you have in mind what I've just said about threats and, and challenges, it's difficult to separate the concept of foreign policy I outlined from an important defense dimension. So I think one of the areas in which we will have to work in the coming years, and it's not easy, is to look at all this. I think there are two combining factors here that can play a role. One is the fact that the United States is reconsidering its, the way it promotes its interests around the world and the degree to which they wish to be present in regional theaters. Uh, I think the discussion you've had about Syria illustrates to a large extent, this kind of debate. Before that, about Libya. Uh, so we need to take that into consideration. There's also what some people in Washington call the pivot to Asia, uh, which, in my view, is not done at the detriment of Europe. It's more done at the detriment of the Middle East and Afghanistan, Iraq, and all that. But still, it's a movement and an important option and priority for America. So we have to take that factor in consideration, in the sense that it may be will force, at least invite, the Europeans to have a, a more agile presence in terms of foreign policy and security. That's one factor. The other one is the budgetary factor. I mean, we are, all our countries, including the United States, for obvious reasons, uh, having budgetary problems. Uh, we have to reduce our debt. In order to reduce our debt, external debt, we need to reduce our deficit, budgetary deficit, and in order to reduce that, we need to cut on the expenditure. Uh, so there will be less money available for each policy. Uh, we, are, we have in the European Union to try to maximize 
the money that we can mobilize for defense. And one of the ways of doing that is to work better together. Instead of duplicating investment, trying to you know, share, pool and share uh, financial resources to achieve the same goal with less money. So the combination of these two factors, the US attitude around the world and the budgetary constraints, I believe that maybe out of these two factors one can uh, build uh, further progress in European defense, which will be a major element of credibility of our foreign policy. Let's see what the future brings on that front. Hey, um, you, you mentioned the relationship with the EU and the uh, United States, and you were also went on a global thing, but you never mentioned Asia or Sub-Saharan Africa. So I don't understand how the EU can look to globalize uh, their relationship, but don't include third world countries, if you can speak on that. Thank you. I, I had to leave some issues for you to raise, otherwise I would cover everything. Uh, well, let's start with Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, I think we are, I'm sure you know this, but the uh, European Union is the, the single most important provider of humanitarian and development aid in the world. Uh, a large part of it is concentrated in Sub-Saharan Africa. We, we remain committed for historic reasons, cultural reasons, and solid political priorities to the development of this part of the world. We, we believe that Africa has an immense potential and I think uh, the 21st century will be the century of Africa, at least I hope, and I see signs of that, uh, and that our commitment will not diminish. We believe we can work well with the US in Africa, also because other partners are coming to Africa. Uh, new uh, providers of development aid, but also partners that do not necessarily share our values and concepts for developing uh, development aid. And, uh, and I believe uh, some of these ideas are not necessarily the best ones uh, for the interest of the African people, we believe. And uh, I think there's a lot we can do, American and Europeans, to coordinate our efforts uh, in promoting uh, not only economic development, but also democracy and human rights social development, gender equality, you know where we stand, where, where we stand for. And uh, I'm very, I think there's promising signs in uh, a number of countries in Africa these days. There are some worrying signs as well. And we need to continue <coughs> to work together with the US on that. But also with the United Nations, obviously. On Asia, uh, I referred to you briefly, the pivot to Asia, as some in Washington call it. Uh, le let me let me tell you how I, I see that. I, I, th I think it's only normal that a Pacific country like the United States uh, has an interest in the Pacific. Um, normal. Secondly, uh, we welcome uh, the investment and the attention of the United States in making sure that Asia, uh, Southeast Asia, East Asia, uh, is, uh, is a stable uh, environment. You know, it's important that there is stability, that there is security uh, in that region, also not only for economic, not only for political reasons, but also for economic reasons. We want those channels of, uh, an, uh, of, of trade to, to be open and free. It's, an, it's, inter it's important for us as much as it is for you. So we very much welcome American attention and investment in the region. You have an influence there, a leverage there that we don't have, even military. And, uh, and I think Europe welcomes that. And the third point is to say that this is also an invitation for us to work more on Asia as European Union. And I recognize maybe that we should sort of upgrade our capability and our investment in that region. And the fact that America is doing more is an invitation for us to do more, but also for us to do more together. Come back to the same narrative. Uh, we share basically the same values. We have fundamentally the same strategic interest, certainly in that part of the world, and uh, why shouldn't we work more together? And I can tell you that we are working on ways and means to, to achieve those goals. Okay, we have time for one more question, so please try to keep your question brief. Uh, I'm Jennifer Lopez, and I have a question for Dr. Kaplan. 
you very much. Um, given the recent uh, result of the German election um, and a lot of the talk about Angela Merkel being the very much the leading figurehead in European politics these days, what do you think, how do you think her election and her term will change or affect policies in the European Union? Well, a, a couple of comments. First of all, to say that um, I think it's uh, regardless of what you think of the political parties and political leaders in Germany, and I certainly don't think anything uh, in terms of, uh, 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 at least as a European Union ambassador. Uh, regardless of those considerations, uh, I think one needs to uh, realize that uh, the vote in uh, the results of the elections in Germany are a sign of stability. Stability of the European institutions, European Union institutions, stability of the, of the European public opinion, public debate, that a country uh, re-elects its leader for the third time in a row is, is a sign of maturity, I would say. Again, regardless of what you think of the political uh, persons and ideas and parties. First point. Second point. Uh, there was a, this was a strong pro-European vote in Germany. Uh, if you have in mind the turbulence of recent years, if you have in mind the fact that for the first time in Germany uh, a vocally anti-European or at least anti-Euro party emerged, uh, we have to take note of the fact that they did not get to the Parliament. They did not get to above the threshold that would allow them to have uh, representation in the Bundestag. So there is not a single member of the Bundestag that is uh, at least openly against the Euro or that wants the breakup of the Euro area or that wants Germany to come out of the Euro area. So this is an important uh, point as well. So these elements are, in my view, very positive as, a, as we read the, elec the, the election results in, in Germany. This being said, we, we are waiting for the the results of the negotiations for the future government, future coalition, uh, and we will comment upon, upon those results. But I have no doubts that Germany will remain at the heart of Europe as a, as a very influential and very important country in Europe, very committed to the European project. Uh, and you must realize, and I discussed this a lot in the US in the last few years, in the light of the debate in Europe and the problems in the Euro area, uh, I used to say that Germany will be uh, the last country uh, to will want to abandon the euro area. I think they, I used to say they will switch, switch, off, uh, switch off the lights if ever we come to, to any breakup of the euro area. Uh, the euro is fundamental for, for Germany and Germany is fundamental for the euro. Uh, and this relationship, I, would, I think, will stay there for many years. So I'm very confident and very optimistic about the future of the euro area. I don't think it will ever break up. I think it is going to enlarge. And in fact, next year we will have Latvia joining the euro area. So for all of those, and there were many in this country telling me in sessions like this only a year ago or two years ago or three years ago that uh, uh, the euro will break up, the union will break up. Not only they didn't break up, we got a new member of the European Union, Croatia, and we will have a new member of the Euro area, Latvia, in January. So I'm a happier uh, ambassador than I was uh, uh, a couple of years ago. <laughs> and I hope that you are more confident on the future of Europe than you were uh, a couple of years ago. Thank you very much. I just want to thank you. Your uh, very positive comments were really appreciated. I'm glad that you can see that getting out of Washington, you find that things are very much happening and alive. And we thank you all for being here. I hope you have a wonderful visit. And as we say in North Carolina, y'all come back now. <laughs> I will. I will. Thank you very much, Dr. Scott. Thank you. Thank you.